In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you for coming back. We are going to continue from where we left off. Um, now we are um, starting chapter three of the first epistle of, of St. Peter. Um, and we'll get straight to it. In this chapter, really, St. Peter addresses um, the issue of our family relationships in Christ. And so he starts with wives. And so in verse one and two, we read, wives likewise. Be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And so if you remember at the end of chapter two, St. Peter was discussing house slaves and their um, task or their you know, teaching to uh, submit to the authorities. And so after the house slaves, St. Peter now turns to the wives, since in some degree, you know, they too are vulnerable to their unbelieving husbands, if that's the case, even in the same way that house slaves are to their masters. And so all Christians are to submit to their proper authorities. This is what he was alluding to in chapter 2, verse 13. House slaves must submit to their masters, and wives must submit to their own husbands following their leadership. And it is this, you know, shared and universal obligation to submit that connects the house slave with the wife. And so St. Peter says that wives must likewise submit to their husbands, even as house slaves submit to their own masters. And so this submission is not unique to the spousal relationship, but it's common for all Christians. And so wives don't submit in the same way that slaves do, right? This, this is different. Unlike slaves, um, you know, the, the submit, the submission here to their husbands are submission as equals. So we know that in the Christian mindset that Christian wives are co-heirs of the same grace of the eternal life as their Christian husbands. Right? This is um, said in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Theirs is not like this, you know, um, negative, servile submission. It's not an absolute submission. No, the submission has its source in the wife's fear of Christ. And above, uh, you know, Christians are not to fear the flesh and blood. Rather, this fear refers to the wife's reverence for Christ so that she willingly follows her husband's lead as a way of serving our Lord, right? This, of course, sets limits to her submission for because she would never submit to her husband if doing so would contradict her faith in Christ. And so unlike the submission expected of the wives of the pagans, which was absolute, by the way, the submission of the Christian wife is submission of one who belongs first and fundamentally uh, to God. And so this submission is especially important in cases where, you know, the, the husbands are disobedient to the word or they're unbelieving. You know, not all Christian women have Christian husbands. And some pagans, um, some pagan husbands, object to their wives' religion, right? Um, this is another example uh, of a difference between the Christian and the pagan submission. In the pagan world, you know, the good wife was expected to abandon her religion if her husband demanded it. Whereas in the Christian ideal, the Christian wife would never do such a thing. And so St. Peter recognizes that, you know, a nagging, nagging the husband to convert them to Christianity it is not likely going to work. It's not likely going to bear fruit. Instead, you know, it actually, you know, might be counterproductive. The husband could say, you know what, just, just look, whatever this new faith is making, like wives, I don't want you to do this anymore. Just obey your husbands. So the submission is absolute in the pagan world. And, you know, all this, all my marriage is perfectly fine until this Jesus came along. And so it would actually be counterproductive if the wife was nagging. And so St. Peter urges the wives to proper submission within the realm of Christianity so that the unbelieving husbands may be gained, right? They may be converted without even a word as they observe the pure conduct of their wives. St. John Chrysostom is noted for saying, you know, preach always and when necessary speak. And I think this is, this kind of goes along with this. It's, it is seeing a life, you know, not an argument that wins people, 
It's seeing Christ in that person. And this purity is not confined to, um, it, this purity also points to the heart, to the heart as well. And so the entire quality of the woman's life um, uh, that commends her faith to her spouse. So, so that's, that's what verses one and two are alluding to. Verses three and four. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You know, St. John Chrysostom says, do you want to be beautiful? Be clothed with giving alms, put on compassion, be filled with chastity, avoid being pride. These are all more honorable than gold and make the ugly look beautiful. Oh woman, when you exaggerate in adorning yourself, you become worse than a naked woman, for you have taken off the beauty of your countenance. If you put on a royal robe, would you put on a robe of slaves? You have to put on, Lord, uh, on the Lord of the angels. How can you go back to earthly matters? To whom are you adorning yourself? Is it to please your husband? Then do it at home, right? So St. John Chrysostom it has a way with words, right? <laughs> it's the golden mouth for a reason. This is why St. Peter also urges the wives not to let their adornment be external only. In the pagan world, women were tempted to obsess about how they look, and it, it actually consumed a lot of their minds. Um, and, you know, to be honest, this temptation, this consumption that, that hasn't faded with time, even is present today. And so, you know, in, in that time, uh, they would spend hours braiding their hair or, you know, putting layer on layer of jewelry and gold and of these, you know, extravagant costs and clothing themselves with expensive dresses, you know, it's this, ex it's this excess that is condemned because it's inconsistent with a life committed to the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Um, you know, no. So uh, the main focus should be whether, where their true beauty lies. It's not the external body, but the hidden person of the heart and the inner person. Outward beauty, you know, one day will fade away. No braiding, no jewelry, no dress can disguise it. And the true adornment of the inner person consisting of a meek and quiet spirit is incorruptible. It'll never fade. So unlike the outward adornments, um, this inner adornment costs nothing. But even so, it, it's, it's costly and precious before God. It's priceless. A wife who is inwardly meek is the one who... Um, their impulses are controlled. The, the virtue of meekness is not weakness and it's not pathetic. It's not, but it's controlled strength. That's what meekness is. It's controlled strength. Um, and not wives only, but all Christians are urged to this, to this fruit of the spirit. A wife is to have a quiet spirit, right? A, this quietness is not total silence, but the inner stillness, the one who is at peace, once again, this virtue should be uh, for all, for all to aspire for. In verse five and six, for in, in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so because of the difficulty of this teaching, uh, St. Peter he uses an example um, of, for inspiration, and he goes to the Old Testament, talks about Sarah and Abraham. So in the same way that the Christian wives are to adorn themselves with a meek and quiet spirit, the holy women who also, who hoped in God, as the Christians do, were also adorning themselves, submitting to their own husbands. And so for example, in Genesis 18, verse 12, it says that Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, Right? Um, and, you know, in the, in the Hebrew context, this term for Lord uh, was the usual term for husband, right? So anyways, the, the word did not, did express the, um, the position of the wife and indicated that Sarah accepted it. So Christian wives who hope in God and look for their reward, um, even though they might have been formerly pagans, now have become Sarah's children, 
through their baptism. And so this presupposes that they continue to live out their baptism, doing good, living in submissiveness and good deeds as she did. And in this way, they, they shouldn't fear any alarm, any terror, or, or give way to fear whatever kind of husbands they have. God will bless them. And so St. Peter gives Sarah, Abraham's wife, as an example, because she was adorned with her, her reliance on God, right? She was after pleasing God, not men. Her submission to her husband, right? Because she calls him my Lord in love. Her good deeds, right? Her, her feeling of no fear at all because she submits. This is not due to fear as a slave, but because of the love, the, the marital love. In verse 7, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So St. Peter now turns to the husbands. St. Peter puts great responsibility on men to treat their wives wisely. And they're not, you know, they're not at risk of mistreatment as you know, the, the men are, are not at risk of mistreatment like house slaves and wives. No, but St. Peter addresses them too, even if it's brief. He says, because husband and wife form one flesh, it is inconceivable that a Christian teaching would be addressed to the wife and not to the husband also. And so the gist of this teaching is that the husbands must be considerate of their wives. It is possible that St. Peter writes out of concern for the women. And so just as a house slave and a wife submit, and so the husband must do likewise. Likewise, that's, that's why the emphasis is on likewise. Um, it's the same kind of connection to the wife's obligation with the housewife's obligation to the husband's obligation, likewise. And so that is all Christians, all Christians must submit to their proper authorities fearing God and obeying him. The husbands work, um, work out the submission to God by co-dwelling with their wives according to knowledge and assigning them honor. And so the husband's behavior towards the wife must reflect his knowledge of God and his demands for a Christian husband should live differently from a pagan one. In particular, the husband must co-dwell with his wife as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman. And, and what does this weakness consist of? You know, not weakness in mind or weakness in character, right? even though the pagan opinion of the ancient days said so. No, the weakness consists of an extra vulnerability, right? The husband must respond to this by protecting their wives and caring for them in love. And also husbands must assign their wives honor since the women are also co-heirs of the grace of life. The eternal life the husband will inherit on the last day will be equally inherited by his wife also, so that they inherit it together as a unity of one flesh, not just as heirs, but co-heirs, right? They will inherit the same kingdom. And if men refuse to honor their wives, in deed and in word, God will judge them. Even now, their prayers will be hindered and rejected by God. In verse 8, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. In the end, the purpose of all these commandments is to have one mind. This is true not only for those who are married, but for everyone, and to have one heart toward one another full brotherly love, compassion, and gentleness. And so in summing up this teaching, for all to have proper submission to their relationships, St. Peter urges all to be of the same mind, sympathetic, brotherly loving, tender-hearted, humble-minded. Especially during times of persecution, it's easy to want a fight, right? And so St. Peter appeals to his hearers to be of the same mind, living harmoniously, refusing to argue over silly things. They must be sympathetic, caring for others in their sorrows and in their needs. They should be brotherly loving, treating one another as true family, as, as close as you can be. 
They must be tender-hearted, with hearts overflowing with compassion, and humble-minded, not thinking evil of any of one in the church, but being a servant of all. In that verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessings, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Some in the world may persecute them or verbally abuse them in slander or, you know, with their words. Even so, St. Peter is saying, don't retaliate. Rendering wickedness for wickedness or a verbal abuse for a verbal abuse. Instead, let them respond by blessing them. It is for this that they were called in baptism, that they might inherit blessing in the age to come. In baptism, we are called to a new life, one in which they will bless others and so be blessed by God in return in the last day. In verse 10, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. St. Augustine said, we will reach the true peace when our nature cleaves to its creator and thus we have no inner conflict. And so again, characteristically of St. Peter's writings, he, he cites Old Testament scripture. He actually cites from Psalm 34. And Psalm 34 teaches that by blessing our enemies, we inherit blessings on the last day. For it was in that Psalm that's, that the prophet David urges the one wanting to love life and to see a good days to stop his tongue from wickedness and his lips from speaking guile so that he turns away from wickedness and does good seeking peace. And so St. Peter portrays the prophet David as saying that one must not return wickedness when, when we encounter wickedness, but we have to stop our tongue. We have to stop our tongue from speaking it and turn away from it. The one who wants life and good days in this age to come must therefore do good even to sinners and seek peace, refusing to retaliate. By refraining from evil and doing good, we attain peace. This is a beautiful promise. And in verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his hearers are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The blessings of life and good deeds in the age to come is sure. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their supplication. He will see how the sinners wickedly use them and will avenge the righteous on the last day. And so St. Peter, <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> and so St. Peter, uh, he's saying to his hearers that they can invoke God's blessings even on those who injure them because justice will eventually be done. The face of the Lord is against those doing wickedness. They can rest in the final justice of God. So St. Peter does not mean that the Lord does not look at evildoers or listen to their prayers. Instead, he says that he might not answer them. Okay, that's just one point to make clear. And in verse 13, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? And so in this final part, I think this is where we're going to end for today. In this final part, St. Peter his exhortations about the Christian interaction with the world that's around them, he, de he deals with the possibility to overcome persecution. This part of St. Peter's exhortation is linked with the previous one by the word and, right? I don't know if you noticed it at the beginning of verse 13. So by citing Psalm 34, he urges his hearers to do good. This is in verse 11. And if they do good, they become zealots for what is good. And the question is, who is there to mistreat them? Even a pagan society tends to reward good deeds aimed at the public welfare. So they should have nothing to fear from pagan society if they're law-abiding Christians. And when a believer realizes that no one can harm them, not even the worst circumstances can harm him unless he harms himself by forsaking doing good. And so... He is not afraid even from the one who wants to kill him. 
for he is certain that he cannot be prevented from doing good. The more his sufferings are abound, the greater his crown will be. And the envious person does not harm the one he envies, but he, but rather he harms himself. That's a very profound statement. Let me say that again. The one who is envious, for example, they don't harm the one that he envies, but he is actually hurting himself. The oppressor, right? He harms himself and does not harm the one that he oppresses. So suffering, um, sufferings do not produce harm, but rather blessings to the one who endures them for the sake of righteousness. And so we'll stop here. Next time we'll, we'll continue on verse 14. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Thanks again for joining us.